Hello everyone and welcome from Westminster Libraries. My name is Monica and with my colleague Sarah, we are delighted to welcome back Kate McDonnell, a literary historian and the director of Handheld, of Handheld Press for today's talk, Archaeology and the Supernatural. Today, Kate is in conversation with Tamara Thornton, with Amara Thornton, historian of archaeology and Katie Saw, Senior Lecturer in Classical Archaeology. Before we get started, just to let you know that the talk would be approximately 40 minutes, followed by a Q&A. Do feel free to send us your questions at any point during the talk. The chat feature has been turned off, so please type all your comments in the Q&A. The moderator, Sarah, is here with me this afternoon and we look forward to seeing your questions. Well, that's all from me. I shall hand over to Kate and our guests. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. And hello, everybody. Very good to have you with us again. Let me introduce um, Amara Thornton. Amara, can you wave for those who can't see the writing? And Katie Soar. Amara, could you begin by just giving us a brief background of what you do in archaeology and what you're doing right now, the projects you're working on? Sure. Uh, I am a historian of archaeology, so I am not an archaeologist. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, and basically, I research, um, I started out researching British archaeologists who worked in the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East in the uh, late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, but at the moment, I'm a co-investigator on a project called Beyond Notability, um, re-evaluating women's work in archaeology, history, and heritage in Britain, 1870 to 1950, quite a long title. Um, but essentially what we're doing is um, going through the archives of the Society of Antiquaries and the Royal Archaeological Institute and harvesting, I suppose you could call it, the names, or excavating if you like, the names of women who appear in, in the archives. Um, some of them were fellows of the society and some of them were not. So we're trying to assemble a sort of uh, a group um, so that we could get a sort of overarching picture of what women were doing in those fields at that time. Okay, thank you. Now, Katie, your turn. Give us your background and what you do. <laughs> Uh, I am an archaeologist, I guess. Um, I'm a lecturer in classical archaeology at the University of Winchester, uh, but that mainly Greek archaeology. My background's in Bronze Age Aegean archaeology, so my PhD was on Minoans. Um, so that's kind of my background research, but I'm also interested in researching um, a little kind of similar to more about the history of archaeology or the reception of archaeology, how archaeology is depicted or how archaeology is used in various elements of popular culture, so in fiction particularly, uh, and things like that as well. So not just Greek archaeology, but uh, any kind of archaeology really. Okay, right, thank you. And um, unusually I also have a, a, a foot in the foot in the game because I was an archaeological editor. I worked for English Heritage as an academic editor. It's my first proper job post PhD. But I've also done a lot of editing of archaeological journals and I have a special interest in archaeological bibliography. Um, it's something I, most archaeologists absolutely hate, but I'm quite good at it. So it's something I specialised in and I've, I've learned a lot about how archaeology, the historiography of archaeology, how the writing about archaeology has changed over the last 100 years from the Ministry of Works onwards, um, which has got almost nothing to do with the book that we've put together. Um, a brief outline, what we, about in 2019, Amara got in touch with me, I think we, we were talking at a book launch and you said, would you like to do this? And I said, absolutely. And then we started emailing in 2019. So it's taken three years for this book, Strange Relics, to come out because it's taken a long time to pick, pick, pick the stories, to work out how we're going to present it but now it's here. So what I want to do today, we're going to discuss the pitfalls of archaeology in literature and then narrow down to these stories and why this book. So I've, I've, I've identified there are two major pitfall areas that I think archaeology in literature, in story, in fiction has. The first one is simple outdated othering, racism, colonialism, sexism and so on. 
And the other one is scientific outdatedness, which is a little different. But let's focus on the, 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 the sort of anthropological othering. Um, can you give me any examples of othering that you've managed to avoid? What were you discarding when you were making the selection of stories in this anthology? Well, <laughs> go on then. <laughs> um, we were looking mainly at stories from the earlier part of the 20th century and from any part of the globe, so not just sort of archaeology in Britain. And obviously when it comes to some of the stories that were set in South America, in Africa, for example, there were some very distinctly outdated, um, very colonial attitudes. To, also in the US as well. And the US, yes, mm -hmm. of course, in North America too. So one of the things we really wanted to avoid was including any stories that had that very outdated racist attitude to um, the inhabitants of North America, South America. Africa, for example, that a lot of the early stories had in them <laughs> considerably. I think, mm -hmm. I mean, also we were kind of, um, just to continue on with that, we, we were kind of um, hamstrung, I suppose you could say, by the fact that we were um, mostly doing this research during lockdown. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we were very dependent on things that were available to us online. And, um, just because of that, partly because of that, um, that kind of dictated the authorship and the source sort of magazines that we were looking at because we had to depend on digitized material. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's a, a bias there towards authors who are um, white sort of Anglo-European men mostly, but we, we, <laughs> we did have some women in there um but uh, you know that that is gonna frame the kinds of stories that they tell and the the people who are privileged in those stories and so i mean weird tales was a, a great resource for mm -hmm. us but um it's a pulp magazine and a pulp magazine yeah. <laughs> there's a copy of weird tales yeah <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um and a pulp, a pulp magazine is going to um you know, talk about people in very particular ways if they are not white. <laughs> and so um, I was very, um, I was very clear with myself that I didn't want to have N words appearing in any of the stories that we had. I don't think we do, but um, you don't, no. you don't think, yeah. <clears throat> and so, so I think, I mean, that for me, that was something that I, I was, hoping to avoid and it's you know it's very difficult because it that kind of language is is very widely well, it was, used it was endemic <laughs> yeah that's yeah. how people spoke before the second world war and for quite a long time after as well yeah yeah, yeah. and it you know i would have liked to be able to um to find stories that were written by people like, for example, my mother's from the, the Caribbean and I would have loved to have a story that was um, mm -hmm. written by someone from the Caribbean, but that it just wasn't, <laughs> wasn't findable. Um, I'm, it might be out there, which would be fantastic, but we weren't able to find it in the circumstances that we found ourselves in, in between 2019 and now so <laughs> yeah yeah well maybe for volume two now that travel yeah. is possible again who knows yeah. yeah i did i did actually find um when i was looking for things at the british library a couple of times i went um there is a, a magazine called the victoria quarterly which was published in jamaica in the 19th century and um although it's it's impossible to tell what background people have as authors, it was actually produced in Jamaica, and mm. it did reference um, sort of folk tales and so on that were prevalent in Jamaica at the time. Um, they weren't going to work for our purposes, <laughs> sadly, mm. but um, but it was something that I was trying to find, and I'm sure that there are other, you know, other things out there. There, but there were only a couple of, of issues of the magazine available at the British Library, and it hasn't been digitized, so um, there could be other things in there that might be useful. Well, this is where we can but. put a call out. If anybody <laughs> knows of a story that they think needs to get reproduced, 
um, let us know. Send us a scan, give us the publication details, and that would really help. Um, moving on, well, so that was racism and colonialism. Was there any outright sexism in stories that was just so offensive that it stopped some stories coming in? Or did that really not appear so much? I don't remember anything to... No. I mean, I think there were some rather outdated references or the way they referred to women in it, perhaps, particularly, mm. um, again, sort of indigenous women or native women. But the main thing was mainly the lack of women, mm. particularly, mm -hmm. again, as we were... Again, as Amora said, we were kind of hamstrung by being able to look at sort of quite popular pulp magazines that were available to us online, mm -hmm. which skewed very much to, as you said, sort of the white male, the Anglo-American. I don't think we have a non-American or English or British author. Mm. So, no, I don't think not you do. An author, no. 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 And so, you were just looking in Anglophone literature. Because yeah, exactly. We, yeah, so we don't have the funds for translation as well. Place. So that yeah. could have been something that opened up a big, a wider array, but um, yeah, being mm -hmm. kind of reliant on what was available online, which yeah. people digitised, so which we're very grateful for the people who have uh, <laughs> spent a long time digitising old magazines, but um, mainly it was the, not so much the lack of women, but the lack of women in, in roles that had agency or mm -hmm. protagonists, there were women in, in the background or women as... as um, smaller characters, side characters, victims, whatever you, um, whatever, but um, not that many had the woman as the protagonist, as the woman, as someone who had agency and was actually the central yeah. part. I think we, we, we found some and they're in there and they're, and they're yeah. good. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think just to add to that, um, some, like the one story that was written by a woman, uh, one of the stories that was written by a woman in our, in our volume doesn't have a, a female protagonist. So, the next heir, which is um, by H.D. Everett, um, the the protagonist in that is a man, mm. and um, which is fine. You know, that's fine. I mean, she's allowed to do that. Um, but but we did really look for, and we had it in our minds to look for a story stories, if possible, um, that had a female protagonist, because that's not because M.R. James sort of dominates the landscape of of archaeology and the supernatural and I don't think he has many women if any in his <laughs> stories no um, no I can't think of any um yeah. we, we wanted to be able to add something yeah with the protagonists yeah mm. you know as and well as the just, authors this is just short stories because of course when you come to novels you've got Agatha Christie's death mm -hmm. comes at the end which isn't strictly an archaeological story but it's based on archaeological background um and then there's also, there's a novel by Neil Gunn set in the 1950s about the excavation of a, a, a standing stone circle in Scotland, which is, it does have some women characters, but it's, again, it's male. It, yeah, by, but by opening the field in the literary sense to novels, to full, fuller texts, it's possible women may have written literary studies of something or other using archaeology, I don't know, but certainly... Well, Marjorie literary. Lawrence definitely does. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely but we were restricted to short stories in a short anthology yeah moving on to the other idea of scientific outdatedness I was thinking about Jaquetta Hawkes's A Land which I find now completely unreadable because it is so dated the science is so completely dated I don't know if either of you have come across it Mm -hmm. I'm definitely I haven't read it but I, I haven't I read it either it, obviously yeah well she she uses her archaeological knowledge and her massive experience as a prehistorian and she talks about and she brings in other stuff like the uh, pale paleology as well and the history of the earth and there's chemistry and biology and it's going even I a non-scientist can tell that the science has moved on and I can't read this now because so much of that narrative rests on the idea that this is up-to-date science and I wonder does do any of the short stories in Strange Relics depend upon up-to-date science or do the authors manage to not make that quite so critical? I'm not sure about science I mean I think you could argue the Arthur Macken story relies on outdated theories about yeah, humans Turanian, and yeah, human Turanian. groups um, the, yeah the Turanian theory mm -hmm. um, though I don't know that's not specifically science in the sense of you know, stratigraphy, geology, that type of thing. Um, I don't 
think any of them do. Um, I think, I mean, one of the things about this, the stories that we've chosen is that most of them aren't really about excavation. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Yeah. So um, we've really kind of focused on how archaeology kind of interacts with the everyday, taking mm -hmm. it outside of, mm -hmm. of a sort of excavation -y context, if you like. So I don't think our, our selection is, is kind of as focused on the, the sort of scientific theories of the day. Although we do have archaeologists, I mean, there are a number of archaeologists who are writing the stories. Yeah. So, um, so you do get sort of hints of what they're interested in. Yeah. Um, and I know Katie has, has um, you know, with her interest in Bronze Age archaeology and Alan Weiss being one of our, a key Bronze Age archaeologist or a classical archaeologist in Greece being one of our authors. Um, you know, there Katie is, yeah. can there talk is this sort more of hint about that. that in there as well, the sort of current theories about um, the history of the Aegean, you know, the dominant civilizations in the Aegean at the time, but it's something that you probably wouldn't, it doesn't distract you and you wouldn't really know it was there if you didn't know yeah. about that. It's not a dominating theme. No. But yeah, as Amara says, I don't, there's no excavations in it. And, well, there are, with um, Arthur Conan Doyle's story. Yeah, that one, yeah. That mm -hmm. one is set in an excavation, but it's the, it has a female protagonist also. <laughs> um, but, sh but her engagement with the site is not, scientific as yeah. it were. <laughs> the sort of excavation is the setting for the story but it's not in integral to the story. No. In the no. Sense no. The well it is, it is, it is yeah. integral in that in in that it has an effect on her but yeah. it's not integral in the the process of excavation isn't integral the, yeah. the setting yeah. of an excavation is if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so. And I, I find that very interesting that none of the authors wanted to grapple with the processes um, probably not because they thought this will be dated in 10 years, I cannot do this, but more likely it's just not relevant to the storytelling. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think archaeology tells some stories, but these stories are not about archaeology, they're using archaeology to kick off and go supernatural. Yeah. yeah, and I think also one of the things, at least for the archaeologists um, who are writing stories for us, with the exception of Alan Wace, um, they weren't operating as archaeologists all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they no. had other things they were doing. So MR James was, um, you know, working in Cambridge um, and writing ghost stories. And so was EF Benson, not working in Cambridge, but he was also, you mm -hmm. know, a full-time writer. So I think one of the things that that kind of um, emphasizes, I suppose, is that not all archaeologists work in archaeology all the time. And that's true mm -hmm. even today. <laughs> You know, lots you of other people argue, do archaeology and have other jobs. Yeah. This is also with Wace. He was, you know, what, for a better word, a full-time archaeologist. That was his job. Uh, he was director of British School of Athens and everything. But again, there's a kind of separation from the day job, I think, because the stories that Golden Ring comes out of were entertainment to, to tell around the campfire mm -hmm. after the excavation of the evening. So um, he would make these stories up and... I guess this, you know, particularly if you're surrounded by other archaeologists who are digging all day with you, the minutiae of excavation <laughs> process is probably not particularly entertaining. Yeah, or um, relevant, yeah. So he's, he doesn't really talk about that. And then for the others who aren't archaeologists, it's not something they would necessarily have any information of or about. Or so, want to put in their stories. Or want to put in, exactly. So, um, Even if they had it. Exactly. So they're either not you know, they have an archaeological background, but they're not archaeologists at the time of writing. Yeah. Or they're writing almost to get away from the archaeology. It's the end of the day, it's telling stories, it's a distraction. Mm -hmm. Or they don't have that archaeological background or, or knowledge to begin with. So mm -hmm. it's not an integral part of the stories. It's not an integral part of what makes them haunted. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I, think, just, go on. I think also, just to say that um, a number of archaeologists, I mean, not all, all archaeologists by any means, but a number of archaeologists liked the thought of archaeology and the supernatural. They mm. enjoyed it. It mm -hmm. was something that they um, they kind of fed into in various ways. So the famously, we've got Margaret Murray, who is yeah. an Egyptologist, <laughs> who was very um, kind of tongue-in-cheek <laughs> engaged in, um, in, in, talking about archaeology and the supernatural um, and she has a whole chapter. I mean, she 
had another career as a, a historian of witchcraft, which is another story, but um, she knew what the power of the, the occult and the supernatural was for people and that archeology span was, was integral in people's fascination with that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, I think for some archeologists it's a, it's a thing that they played with and it yeah. was entertaining yeah. for them in that way. Let's just, I'm gonna, for those who haven't actually bought their book yet, I will tell you who is in this volume. So we have Arthur Macken, who's very well known in the weird field, Arthur Conan Doyle, a detective novelist, and he also wrote some pretty good sensational fiction about extraordinary fantastical ha happenings. E.F. Benson, very famous for Map and Lucia, but his supernatural stories are extraordinary. He's such a strong writer of the supernatural. H.D. Everett, no one knows about her. Amara, tell us about H.D. Everett. Um, well, I wasn't actually able to find out that much other than um, she lived in Staffordshire. Mm -hmm. um, and I think her husband was a solicitor or something like that. Um, but she got married very young and she had um, a few children and she started writing, you know, fairly soon after she got married. So she was a working mum, if you like. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> she, she um, published a lot of stories in, some of them were serialized in newspapers and some of them were fully fledged um, fully fledged novels. Uh, she wrote a novel about a sort of um, an ancient Egyptian princess who sort of, who, who is brought from um, Egypt to London and then not resurrected exactly, but she kind of emerges um, called, uh, what is it called? Uh, I can't remember. Anyway, um, but she also publishes uh, an anthology in 1920 of short stories. And I just happened to come across it because I had a, a volume which was called Ghost Writings, which was published by the British Library. And it mm. had a number of authors in it. Um, and H.G. Everett um, was included in that. And, and she was, um, her stories were picked up by M.R. James. She ah. was um, sort of, uh, mentioned in M.R. James, one of M.R. James's essays about ghost stories as being particularly competent <laughs> as an author. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of um, got my interest going. And so I found this anthology that she'd written in 1920 online. And, and um, interestingly, the title does not automatically tell you that it's a story about archaeology. And I was, when I was looking for, um, stories for Strange Relics as it would become. The titles were actually the thing yeah. that I was looking for mostly. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of flicking through the anthology on archive.org and all of a sudden my eye, like out of the side of my eye, I saw Roman something or another and I yeah. thought, hang on a second. <laughs> so I went back and I kind of, um, I kind of went to the beginning of the story and started reading it and I thought, oh my goodness, this is perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it I sent it off to yeah. Katie and um, yeah. And we all loved it. Yeah, it's a mm. pretty strong story. Okay, so that's H.D. Everett. Um, M.R. James, extremely well known in the supernatural field. Marjorie, Marjorie Lawrence. Now we've already published Marjorie Lawrence in one of our Women's Weird anthologies. So we knew we knew her quality and her, yeah, her story is an Egyptian based one, which is unusual. Eleanor Scott, again, really well known in the weird, but not so much in archaeology, though, as you said, Katie, at the book launch, she does like a barrow. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> She's keen on digging up mounds. John Buchan, who people forget was an extremely good supernatural writer and is my special subject, did my PhD in him. Algernon Blackwood, weird, weird, weird. Dorothy Quick. Katie, tell us about Dorothy. In fact, before you do, look, look at my, I have the original. So this is where the cover image came from, from Weird Tales. And this is the Dorothy Quick story. So how mm -hmm. did you just come across this one? I'm going to pass that one back to Amara, sorry, because I believe it was Amara okay, who did right. the, um, <laughs> but we sort of split the biographies and the biography research. And I think Dorothy Quick was, uh, was Amara, yes. sorry. sorry. Oh, no, no, not at all. <laughs> 
Um, Dorothy Quick, well, Dorothy Quick is, I think, um, one of my favorite authors from, <laughs> from the whole anthology because, um, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time going through weird tales and um, I came across uh, that amazing image. Mm. And again, the, the story doesn't necessarily, the title, sorry, doesn't necessarily tell you what it's about, but yeah, luckily, yeah. <laughs> luckily, weird tales um, usually on their table of contents, which is quite handy, they will publish a little like a tagline. Yeah. 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 Um, and that's really what I used to um, get a sense of how much archaeology was being published in Weird, weird mm. Tales because there's a lot and it's like not just spooky stories but but science fiction and fantasy and like all sorts and um, anyway Dorothy Quick is probably one of the most interesting writers for our purposes because she was very interested in historical material culture so the cracks of time happens to be about a tile but if you look at the kinds of stories she was publishing in Weird Tales, almost all of them feature some kind of historical material culture. It could be a mm. building, it could be a manuscript, it could be, there's like one where it's um, a shard of medieval glass, like stained glass. Mm -hmm. um, and she just uses these bits of material culture to, to weave a story around, usually with some sort of um, with some, some sort of fantastic uh, element to it. Um, there's a Tudor door, the painted door, I think it's called. That story is quite good out of the, out of the ones I've listed. Um, and so I, she, and one of the reasons that I find her such a compelling individual is that she really liked writing for pulp magazines and she was unashamed about it. Um, and there's a great interview that um, someone did with her in the 1940s. And she said, you know, I'm not sorry that I write for the pulps. They are a fantastic venue for writers. And I uh, thought, yeah. <laughs> own it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, also she had, she met um, Mark Twain as a child, which is, has very problematic undertones, but, um, but she's mostly known for that, but she had this, you know, kind of amazing, amazingly productive career as a pulp writer. And, and she reviewed books and films for, a, she had a column called A Quick Look at Things, which I think is quite <laughs> clever. Um, and so you get the sense that she just has her finger on the pulse of, yeah. you know, pop culture and it comes mm -hmm. through in her stories, I think, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with H.D. Everett, Dorothy Quick, those two are the discoveries, I think. Um, the last two authors in the volume are Rose McCauley, whom Handheld publishes a lot of. She is my girl. And Alan B. 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 Wace, who Katie's already mentioned, director of the British School in Athens or Rome? Athens. Athens, yeah. Athens, yeah. It's a pretty big selection. But I think my final question to you both, which might go on for a long time, um, in the blurb for either this event or another, I said, we're going to be looking at the gritty things under the fingernails of the archaeologist's soul. And after I'd written that, I thought, well, that's good. What on earth do I mean? So, <laughs> I, <laughs> so I was wondering, did you find anything that can't wash out of your memory? Is there anything in the stories that you think, maybe I wish I hadn't read that or... That is so memorable. I cannot forget that. What has stuck? Ooh. It's a very good question. This might be a time for spoilers. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Are we are we allowed to spoil? Um, maybe <laughs> without mentioning the story you're spoiling, that might make it less painful. Okay. If you can. Um. And um, I'll I'll do one. Um, okay. The story Please about start. yeah a, a baby who has died. Um, and what happens to that baby's soul and the absolutely appalling colonial attitudes of the white woman who's also strongly evident in the story. I will never forget that story. It's actually not one of the strongest ones. My feeling is it's pretty good, but it's not one of the really outstanding ones, but it's just the juxtaposition of a dead baby and people making decisions about it, which are not what the mother wants. I ha. Ah. I found that remarkable. So it's sort of anthropology. It's not really archaeology, but archaeology comes into it a bit later. Um, 
yes, it's simple human understanding and simple outrage on the part of the interfering here yeah, against these dreadful interfering people. I think that's the one that actually I was thinking as well as it was stayed with me because some of them I knew already. So it's kind of hard to decide whether they've stuck in my mind because they were kind yeah. of already there. Mm -hmm. um, but of the ones that were new to me, that was new to me. Um, and yeah, the points you raised certainly make it stick in your craw in a way. A bit, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Mm. Um, what else is there? So I'm just looking at the list and trying to think. I think, I mean, for me, the, the, the bits that I would pull out, not necessarily for being um, shocked or or disappointed or horrified by the attitudes because they're kind of all already there in most of the stories. There's some pretty mm. appalling attitudes being displayed, so that kind of goes with the territory. But um, but I think the I think you know we don't necessarily have um, stories that have over ghosts or like moments yeah. of mm -hmm. moments of of horror particularly, but there are moments I think that I remember because they creeped me out. <laughs> okay. And there's one, um, the, the moment in one of the stories where the animal looks back at the protagonist. Yeah, I remember that one. That's... And you think, okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's creepy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there are other things that are kind of more um, substantial, I suppose, in a supernatural sense that happen in that story. But it's that mm -hmm. moment and the moment in the hotel garden just before that, those two yeah. moments in that story are kind of like, you get the sort of the shivers up your spine. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. I, ha I had that similar feeling with um, the moment where uh, the, the protagonist in the story that I won't name is looking out the window and he just sees or thinks he sees out of the corner of his eye a face that's not quite what he's expecting. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you get that kind of that kind of shivery feeling. So um, I think those for me are the most potent. Yes. Um, I moments. Think as well, with me, one of the ones again, I'm trying not to mention it. Um, the ending of one where bad things have happened, but there's no regret at the end. In fact. There's pleasure mm. almost about <laughs> it. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm. Yeah. Um, I think I do. I think, it, yeah, I think I know the one. Yes. The, the protagonist has done something bad, sort of spurred on through things she's seeing that only she can see. Mm. And yes, you, think yes, it, yes, yeah, yes. you think at the end there would be regret and like, what did I do? But in fact, she embraces it. And, mm. and it she is, looks forward to more. Exactly. So yeah, that's, that's a kind of interesting twist on... Yes, yeah. the idea that this is something almost pleasurable, almost, mm -hmm. um, as I think we said in the introduction, seductive about mm. these Yeah, as well. yeah. So it's, um, it's an extremely good treatment of that scene. Yeah, you're right. Mm. I'm also struck by a purely, you know, speaking, uh, we are we are all academic -y based. One of the stories you've got academic evidence laid out, and then using using a set of binoculars, someone says, "Well, I can see this," and you're going. But you can't see that because we know from the academic evidence, from the archival documentary thing you've got here, that you cannot. And oh my goodness, it's the juxtaposition of someone seeing something that you simply know cannot exist. And then the ramifications from that. That, I mean, it's, it's one of the very well-known stories, but it, mm -hmm. it was new to me and I find it very, very striking because it's about archive, I guess. I think what's interesting about that particular story also, um, given that its author given the um, interest of its author, mm. um, is that you know that he wishes those binoculars existed. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I don't think he'd get his hands dirty in the way needed to create those. No. But I'm sure if someone gave him a pair, he'd be very happy mm -hmm. to, uh, to take ownership yeah. of them. Oh, the horror. Okay, right. Um, <laughs> which, no, 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 no. Oh yeah, which authors didn't make the selection? Can you remind me, which ones did we throw out 
well, we didn't, ceremoniously. We threw out Broster, but not because we didn't like her, um, because she yes. was coming out in another of your, in yeah. another room from the abyss. Yeah, DK Broster is the pavement, which is about mm. discovery of a Roman pavement and what it does to the person it discovers it. We have published in DK Broster's From the Abyss, which came out in August. So you could. It's a very good story. Yeah, we yeah. were we were pretty good at that. We had to jettison that one because yeah, it was, and there was, was no way good. Melissa was letting you have it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, we also had um, Clement Stain that we got rid of for yeah. purposes of copyright, copyright reasons. Mm. Yeah. Um, but you know, that I think you know that story would have given us another interesting angle on the power of remains. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> as it were. Copyright was an issue. There yeah. is, we, I mean, some of Katie's research money help to pay the copyright fees but there's only so many so much money to pay out and some of these authors some of the authors we would have included were extremely expensive like mm -hmm. Agatha Christie could not even be considered there yeah. was just no way we could have afforded her anyway we got other, we've made discoveries that's the lovely thing when you're up against it and you have to work harder you make amazing discoveries it's and I think we made some good good discoveries with this one okay Monica can we bring you back into the game? Yes. Hello. Are there any questions? Has anyone yeah, wanted are, to raise a point? Okay. I, I start. Thank you, by the way. Thank you, uh, Katie, Amara, and Kate. Uh, let's start. Susan Beadle is asking, was the absence of women more among the characters or characters with agency rather than among the authors? Um, both, really. I mean, we did manage to get stories with women protagonists and, and um, by female authors, but there was less of them to pick from. Mm. Yeah, and a number of, like, Eleanor Scott's um, story and H.T. Um, Everett's story were both written by women but not featuring women as yeah. characters yeah. or mm. any char characters without you know I mean there's like briefly women in both of them but they're very you know yeah, so trying to get that upright. balance between female protagonists and female authors didn't necessarily equate to female authors talking about female protagonists it was yeah and we didn't have that I mean I think um Arthur Conan Doyle is an exception but yeah. we didn't really have men authors writing female no. main characters either so yeah the E.F. Benson story has a female character but she's hardly someone you'd like to spend time with no no <laughs> and she doesn't I mean she's she kind of pops in and pops out yeah, she's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's not that nice no she's no. not no I think she no she doesn't deserve it but there we are next question please um uh, by Lucia was there anything by Margaret Murray not that we had lined up. As no, she, I mean I ha I don't think she's she wrote much, if any, fiction. I no, mean, I don't. She much. She wrote about supernatural things, but in a non-fiction yeah. way. <laughs> so if she, yeah, I'm not. I don't think either of us are aware of any fiction she's written. So. Um, That's not to say that she didn't. No, uh, you know, <laughs> making, we I'm haven't. We have yet to find it. But yeah. um, if she did, that would be brilliant, and it'd be a really good thing to include if it was if it was good. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, she's predominantly nonfiction. So yeah. Okay. Next question. Right. That's from Fiona Newton, and she's saying, um, "I live a mile away from the Neil Gunn Monument, which is on Heights of Bray near Dingwall." Mm -hmm. I rented Bray Farm in the valley below at one time. So, another comment by Melissa. I think I remember one of the Benson sisters published pamphlets about their digs in the Middle East and Egypt, but not stories, alas. Mm. No, that's true. She did, um, Maggie Benson did publish with uh, another woman called Janet Gourlay. They published a book called the Temple of Mutt in Asher, which is about their excavations in, in Egypt, so. Okay. Next is Susan, Susan Beadle again. Are, are there any decades when archeology span was more or less popular as a background for these stories? And mm -hmm. can of archeological backgrounds be linked to high profile discoveries such, such as Tutankhamun or Woolly at Ewer? 
Um, I'm trying to think of the weird, weird tales predominantly, well, sort of yeah. early to mid twentieth century. It seems to be more common. Yeah, I mean, there's there what there was a good number of stories that were published in other you know magazines before Weird Tales came out. But I suppose what Weird Tales was able to um, latch onto. I mean, it was published. The first issues were like. 1923 or something so it was oh, really? basically yeah. coincided with June Summer's yeah. tomb. and so they were able to um you know they were able to feature the setting of Egypt and the sort of feet tap into that Egyptomania mania um from the very beginning of the magazine and that's not to say that all of the stories in weird tales are um Egyptological in nature because they are definitely not. I mean, there's a very wide range of ancient civilizations um, mm -hmm. included. Um, but there's also other, you know, there were other um, big excavations that were happening like in South America and so on. So, you know, you get a sense of the wide range of, of um, archeological investigation that's being put out um, and how that's how that's feeding back into to pop to pulp pop and pulp um culture I suppose it's interesting yeah. which ones make that impact and which don't because like so my background's in bronze age of Jean, and that was quite big in, in the press for a while with you know Evans's discovery of Knossos and things like that but it doesn't seem to have made an impact in that kind of area when it comes to these kind of stories that we're looking at there's a lot when of was, class yeah there when was Schliemann digging uh 1890s 18, so um, yeah and, and, like, the 70s also. and there yeah, was a lot of German archaeology, wasn't there, at the very beginning of the 20th century in Turkey and so on? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, because one of John Buckham's most famous novels, Green Mantle, it has a sole female protagonist who is an archaeologist. She doesn't actually do any archaeology in, in the novel, but the point is she's in Turkey as a German archaeologist around about the time that Germans were active in archaeology in that field. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, Buckham just borrowed borrowed something that was in popular culture, I, re I reckon. Yeah, <laughs> well, I think one of the other things that's, that's interesting to think about um, is the way in which archaeology um, is featured in wartime stories. So we have yes. two examples of that in, yeah. in the book, but there are a number of other stories that Weird Tales publishes in World War II, for example, that have to do with archaeology. Like there's a really interesting, um, speaking of Bronze Age archaeology, there's one that's set in Knossos in mm. 19, in the, and it was written during World War II. And it's more of a sort of fantasy, sort of sci-fi story yeah. rather than a, a spooky story particularly. But, um, but it, the protagonist is um, an allied airman who crashes on Knossos, which is occupied by German soldiers. So there's like, yeah, um, there's a whole, a whole, um, yeah, a whole interesting wartime kind of mm. context that, that the pulps pick up on and archaeology is integrated into that. Yeah. As well. One of the last research projects I did when I was a functioning academic was um, reading popular magazines of the First World War, looking for images and texts about disability, mainly shell shock, but also physical impairment. And in hindsight, looking at the catalogue of texts I was discovering, there was an un unnatural number of Egyptology-based stories, not necessarily based on archaeology, but you definitely got the sense that during that war, Egypt excavations in was a locus for adventure and sensation fiction that would take the reader out of themselves mm -hmm. to a different place, an escape, mm -hmm. escape function. Um, they weren't particularly good. That's why I didn't suggest any to you, because I don't, I never remember much being particularly good. But it was certain, it certainly held a fascination at that period when people really needed to read to get away from daily life because it was just so grim and death dreadful. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's an, it's an interesting point, actually, because a lot of the stories that we came across were actually not very good. Um, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, you'd be like, so you'd read the blurb and think, oh, there's something here, and then you start, oh. No. <laughs> Okay. Oh, that yeah. word again. We can't move that one. Okay, there were right. some things that always that like we were surprised how many um, 
stories involve classical, um, particularly classical creatures, if you if you yes. will. Yeah. Um, and that seems to be something that's just universal. You know, there was no particular time when that was popular or not so popular. That was just. I mean, we could have done a collection entirely based on. Um, sort Satyrs. of classical theology and sensors <laughs> yeah. and satires and, and um but that isn't and that, that's just a function of the classical education or yeah i guess that has a lot men writing. As well. yeah if we had taken i don't know if we'd taken an awful lot of stories from spanish writers i don't know whether we would have had that that, that fixation on the latin texts that the british middle and upper classes have been brought up on for 200 years and thus the obsession with pan and fawns and dryads and things like that. Yes, okay. another, another interesting what if of, you know, because we had a primarily yeah. Anglo-American um, authorship, what other mm -hmm. areas and what other, you know, archaeological times and places were popular in other areas rather than yeah. British, um, British and American. I sense a thesis subject coming up. <laughs> yes. Okay, Monica, next question, please. Next question is, what about Edith Nesbitt, who I think wrote ghost stories and also included ancient culture in some of her children's stories and mm -hmm. in the, the history of Amulet? Did you come across any of her stories which might have fitted in this anthology? And if so, why did she not make the cut? <laughs> Don't think we did, did we? We there was one story that I um that I came across which I think was already included in something else. Which oh, is was man, it the man, man size and marble? Man size and marble. That's yeah. in yeah. James's British. Yeah, weird. that's in our yeah. British weird anthology edited by James Machen. So yes, yeah. just man size in marble, which isn't really about archaeology, but it's about walking statues, and that's quite close. But I don't, I mean, I haven't really read much of Edith Nesbitt's supernatural stuff. So. Oh, she does definitely have a thing about archaeology, certainly, because it, you know, it's in her, as the questioner said, it's in her children's yeah. books. Um, <clears throat> and I think, I think she had some sort of, like, correspondence or something with, with Wallace Budge. I seem to remember something about that. But I, um, I don't know who's the, the, um, direct, the keeper of the Egyptian department at the British Museum mm, okay. at the time. Um, but as I say, we didn't find no. anything that would have fitted into our remit from no. her, sadly. So, sorry, sorry. Monica, next one, please. He's asking, MJ Throw has written detective fiction with Margaret Murray as the main character. Um, he hasn't read any, though. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So Margaret Murray Excellent. as a character. Oh, that's an interesting. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Then Jody next is asking, do you think archaeology was too much of a man's world for there too many for there to be many women protagonists? Um, I, think, I would say absolutely not. No. <laughs> I think you'll find if you look into it, there were many, many women in archaeology. Loads of women. So many women. Loads. It's just they're not the ones writing the books, as it were. I mean, yeah. they are, but they're not the ones with the names on the cover. So I, I yeah. think, as I mean, it's Amara's research area, particularly right now. So I'm sure she can tell, fill us in very much. But it's, yeah, there is many, many women in archaeology. They're just not the ones who the public know about. Yeah, I think, and also, I'm not sure because of the, because of the venues in which we were looking for our stories, I think there's a certain um, bias in those venues towards, you know, adventurous men. <laughs> um, and if we were to find stories that had um, women as protagonists and or were written by women, I think we would be more likely to find them, particularly in the earlier period of our chronology in anthologies of short stories. Because I, um, yeah, I don't think in Weird Tales, the, the Dorothy Quick is a woman, written by a woman and features a woman, but I think all of the other ones which have female protagonists are not from Weird Tales, am I correct? Yes, that's, yeah, that's yes. right, yeah. yeah. So that's, as Amara says, it's sort of very much the sort of boy's own adventure. Yeah, that's, I think that adventure. very yeah. much dominates things and you don't have, I don't think, an equivalent girl's own adventure. <laughs> uh, although maybe it exists and we just exactly. weren't able to find it. I don't know. I'm That's it. You are really. 
Yeah, there's an Enid Blyton novel, which I read as a child, and it was from the, uh, it wasn't the five series, it was the seven series, and they go to Egypt and their father does an excavation or something, and there are bad people and they chase the bad people off. Yeah. But that was probably the 50s. Yeah, well, yeah, and Edith, Edith Blyton, uh, Edith Blyton, Enid Blyton, Edith Blyton. Um, also had, there are other stories that she writes that include mm -hmm. archaeology in, like, I think, um, The River of Adventure? That's the that one. That's set, the in, a, the set in Iraq. Adventure. That's the one I'm thinking of. It's yeah. River. Yeah. Set in yeah. Iraq. So um, I can't remember if they see, I think they see some archaeology, like, from the banks of the Tigris or something. I, I think <laughs> It's been a while since I've read that, but, um, yeah. But if Ina Blyton did it, it's highly likely that other women writers who were interested in bringing their child heroes out out of Britain to a more, I don't know, to other, other countries, they may possibly have used archaeology as the reason for. Yeah. Like um, Arthur Ransom, the um, Dot and Dick, their parents are off on a dig, which is why they are sent to the Lake District in winter to have Christmas and meet the Amazons and the Swallows. We know nothing about the archaeology, but it's a common trope. They, you know, the parents went off and did the digging, and that was most both man and woman doing the digging. Mm. Yeah, um, I mean that's and that's kind of, I think, reflective of the reality that there are so yeah. many couples in archaeology yeah. who who are, yes. you know, doing things. Actually, there is one. I'm just thinking of it. There is one book. It's a it's a novel. It's not a short story, so it wouldn't have worked for us. But um, there's a woman called Agnes. Um, Ramsey, who was a, an archaeologist who worked in Turkey with her husband mm -hmm. um, between the 1880s and the 1920s. So for quite a long time, she, they lived in Turkey for um, a number of years. And she wrote a novel called The Romance of Elizabeth, which, in, which was published oh, yeah. in 1896, um, which yeah. is definitely not a happy story. <laughs> I mean, there are various things that happen in it, but it does have a man and a woman as protagonists, mm -hmm. well, as characters who are archaeologists who are in Turkey. And that's early. That's not even yeah. the century. That, yeah, you told me about that one. Yes, it's, yeah. Okay, right. I think we've thrashed that one to death. Monica, <laughs> next one. Just being conscious of time, we have uh, five more questions coming up. But should okay. we not be able to answer all of them, I uh, will definitely email them to you and then pass them on when we share the recording um, with all participants. Now, Danielle is asking, what is each of your favorite stories in the book? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh. Um, God. Katie, you go first. Oh, I have favorite. I have different favorites. I have favorites because I have an attachment to the author. I have a long-standing attachment to the author. I have favorites because I just love the story. I have favorites because it taps into my personal background. So, oh, um, okay. I'll I go think out of the new discovered one, the next air. I think of the ones that were new to me from, from putting this together. I think the next air to me, or the ape. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> I definitely, the, the next air is definitely my favourite, I would say. Yeah. I'm going to wave a flag for John Buchan because John Buchan, Ho the Merry Masons, which I suggested to you, and neither of you knew about it. And it's about a medieval house, so it's a completely different period. But that's one I rediscovered because when I was doing my PhD research, I'm in the British Library going, I know this story exists and it was published once only in a really obscure Christmas anthology in 1933. And by golly, I hunted that down. And that was before the internet, before the online catalog. I was using those massive blue leather bound things. And I found this story and it's almost the last short story Buck and published and it's outstanding. So for that reason, it is my favorite. <laughs> Monica. Lucia, uh, what advice would you give to current horror fiction writers about describing, describing archeological finds? <laughs> don't use too many scientific words say what it smells like feels like what it looks like what it reminds the character who's looking at it of i say that as an editor i would say um <clears throat> i would say bring us the perspective of the 
people who are responsible for finding those things because they are not the director of the dig (laughs) (laughs) by and large Mm -hmm. um and I think that's one of the things that I hope um we will see in you know the years to come is that um we know that archaeology and the supernatural are very popular fields and they have been for quite a long time but the ways in which those stories have been told have been fairly similar. And you get the same sorts of characters coming out. We've tried to um, diversify the field a little bit with a limited um, <laughs> a limited sort of amount of venues. But I think there's loads of scope for taking those same settings and turning them on their heads and bringing us new characters mm. who are much more diverse because they existed in real life that's the thing if you look at any archaeological archive you know the people who are finding the stuff and so those stories are the ones i think that you know deserve to be told now and don't be afraid to think out the box because crux of time has doesn't have an archaeological item in it it's the floor of it. it's a tile in a floor in a sunroom and yet it becomes something through which the past creates kind of horror and, and supernatural entities so you can be original you can think you can utilize an object that perhaps is not stereotypically archaeological mm-hmm. um but it can still work good monica i'm not sure we have time for them um, we have a few more questions by madeline and susan susan has uh, uh, three or four questions coming up i will just take madeline one and then susan we will email your questions to the panelists and get back to you yes yep. about how these writers archaeological training shaped their writing but did you come across evidence their writing or their bold broad interest in the supernatural informing their archaeological work Ooh. Uh, I think only we I think really only Waste was probably writing these stories and mm. practicing yeah. archaeology at the same time. And um these were not these were stories he wrote for for entertainment. He wasn't sort of um they came out posthumously. His wife put them together in a book after he died. So they weren't um, and one of them I think came out in archaeology magazine. Mm. Um, so they weren't for huge consumption the way some like um, some of the other people who were foremost writers um, would have written them. So um, I don't think there was that much connection perhaps between what he was writing for fun and what he was doing in his day job. Certainly it worked the other way around. Some of his stories are very much based on folklore of the Vlachs, who we did ethnographic work with in northern Greece. Um, so some of his stories uh, reflect that, reflect his own what he's doing in the field as well but I think for most of them there is a separation between their writing and then their archaeological practice either they don't they're not practicing archaeology or the period when they were is very is much earlier than the time mm. when they're writing these stories so um I don't think it's I think it works one way but possibly not the other hmm. yeah I definitely agree with that um yeah thank you We'll wrap it up quickly. We only have a few seconds to go. (laughs) And um, thank you so much. Thank you, Kate, again. Thank you, Amara. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Katie, for joining us tonight. Uh, There will be an email in the next days with a feedback form and a link with the recording to this event. We will pass on the questions uh, that are left in the the Q&A to our panelists. And... uh, um, That's it for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you on our next talk and uh, see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.